show me the money. Boeing nets almost $100 billion in orders on day one of the Dubai Air Show. And politicians meet in Washington to discuss the future of Bitcoin. As fears grow, regulation won't prevent it from being used for money laundering and drug trafficking. Hello and welcome, I'm Sally Bundock, you're with World Business Report. In a moment I'll be speaking to a Bitcoin expert who'll be testifying in the Senate later. But first, the Dubai air show is underway and already airlines in the Gulf have placed a, high, a number of high value plane orders. And so far it looks like America's Boeing is beating its arch rival, the European uh, company Airbus. This time after Dubai based Emirates placed a massive order of 150 of Boeing's new 777 mini jumbos in a deal worth $76 billion. Another 109 of those planes were ordered by uh, Etihad Airways, Qatar Airways and Lufthansa. And that brings the total sales to a huge sum of $95 billion in just one day of the Dubai Air Show. Although Boeing had secured more sales. Airbus hasn't done too badly either. Emirates ordered 50 Airbus A380s in a deal worth $23 billion, whilst its local rival Etihad Airways ordered 87 Airbus aircraft in a deal worth $19 billion. And the news coming out of Dubai doesn't end there. In addition to ordering billions of dollars worth of new debts, Abu Dhabi's Etihad is also to become the first Gulf carrier to have its brand flying between European destinations after it bought a stake in Darwin Airline. The small Swiss regional airline is the seventh carrier to which Etihad has taken an equity stake. But it's the first that's agreed to brand its own planes as Etihad Regional and sport the Gulf carrier's paint, thereby marking a turning point in global aviation strategy. The BBC's Simon Atkinson spoke to Etihad Chief Executive James Hogan in Dubai earlier and started off by asking him why this deal made sense. We have an equity group. So the Etihad Equity Group is now starting to appear in aviation jargon. This is the ability for, and I don't see this being the, the last, but for small airlines where we will never operate, where it's at the end of our network and we can achieve scale, we're comfortable with their safety standards, we're comfortable with their management, we truly see this as a win-win scenario. Have you got your eyes on other regional airlines where you'd like to make investments and do similar kind of deals? Look, if obviously in this step we would expect other regional carriers to come and have a chat with us and we're happy to do so. What we're looking for is a strong management team, solid strategy because what we can't do is run those airlines and that's in the hands of the management teams and that's what we want. We want good people running those businesses working with us to achieve top line and bottom line advantages. The way that your business is developing is very different from that of your Gulf rivals primarily Emirates and, and Qatar Airways. We're 10 years old, uh, Emirates are 30 years old, done a great job, got a very clear strategy. We have decided to differentiate through partnership. Air Berlin overnight transformed our position in the German marketplace. With Jet Airways moving into India, 40 million Indians travel internationally each year. That transforms our position over the next 24 months in India, as we have done with Virgin Australia. So to me, in, in, in business, it's about how do you get the, for us as an airline, the right load factor, the right average fare, the right return from the asset, the right feed for markets. And the rules of business are changing in global aviation, and we're at the forefront of that. Now, this market is worth over $5 trillion and each one is worth a staggering $500. I'm talking about Bitcoin, the virtual currency that's become increasingly intertwined with tales of bank robbery, drugs and warlords. And today, it will be the topic of conversation in Washington. The US Homeland Security Committee is convening to explore Bitcoin's potential. Although cyber currency is undoubtedly popular with users, it's still not fully regulated and now academics and regulators are desperate to try to develop ways to gain better control over the shadowy international currency. Well, in a moment, we'll talk to one man that will be speaking at the Washington hearing today. But first of all, here's our North America business correspondent, Richard Taylor, who's got some more facts and figures about Bitcoin. 
Bitcoin has been around for about five years as a so-called cryptocurrency. Uh, that means that all the transactions are very highly digitally encrypted and the identity of both sender and recipient uh, is kept anonymous. It's achieved a degree of infamy more recently after the FBI swooped on the online drug marketplace, the Silk Road, at the beginning of October. They've arrested 29-year-old Ross Albrecht, and they say that he masterminded over $2.1 billion worth of Bitcoin transactions over the past two and a half years of the site's existence. Now, even though Bitcoin is achieving a degree of legitimacy in the real world, being used increasingly, for example, by businesses, it's that level of underworld activity that is now a attracting the attention of the American government and potential regulation. That would spell bad news for Bitcoin as a currency because many people are attracted to Bitcoin precisely by the libertarian utopian ideal of it being a currency free from regulation. Well, let's get more on what lies ahead at the hearing today from Patrick Merck, who will be testifying later as general counsel at the Bitcoin Foundation. Patrick, thanks for being on the programme. Now, there are almost uh, 12 million of these Bitcoins in circulation, uh, so we're told, via some uh, measures. Tell us more about how it works and why there needs to be this conversation today in the Senate to make sure it works in a legitimate manner. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Uh, Bitcoin is an open protocol network. So when you have a Bitcoin and you transact it on the network, it, it happens across a public and transparent ledger. Bitcoin is actually a very open network uh, where anybody can see every transaction that happens. What we're finding is not that it's a haven for illegitimate activity, but that there are many legitimate uses. In fact, a lot of the federal agencies that will be coming before the uh, panel to, uh, today uh, have pointed out, gone to great pains to point out the many legitimate uses for Bitcoin that exist. Uh, a merchant processing acquirer uh, company like BitPay has over 12,000 merchants signed up to date. That's 12,000 legitimate uses for spending your Bitcoins just from one uh, one company, and there are many of those companies that are out there right now. So I would challenge that it's actually uh, a haven for illegitimate use or bad actors. We think that the bad actors tend to gather around centralized currency systems which are easier to manipulate and, and hide information. Uh, decentralized systems like Bitcoin tend to attract the good actors out of the space. As you say though, the, the nature of how it works in the sense that uh, there's, there's a lot of privacy there for the, the users of Bitcoins does mean that it, it can be used illegitimately and the, and the Silk Road uh, example is, is prime and doesn't help your cause at all. Also the fact that the founder of the organization or founders, nobody knows who he or she is using a, a, a pseudonym. Why does there have to be this level of privacy? Well, law-abiding citizens have a good reason to have privacy in their lives, especially in their online transactions. I know that here in Washington, D.C., you know, there's been a lot of concern about privacy online and individuals' rights and individual choice about how private they can be and how private their transactions are. But we should, you know, make a difference between uh, privacy and anonymity. Uh, in, in the Bitcoin system, there is a degree of privacy, but it's debatable right now how much privacy you can actually have. Uh, on the network. Some studies have shown that it, with even just four transactions on the blockchain, the public ledger that Bitcoin uses, you can start to trace transactions and identify users. That dynamic will change over time. It will shift. Um, if Bitcoin becomes some tool of mass surveillance, the blockchain does, uh, then you'll see action taken by software engineers and developers to increase privacy on the network. Um, that that's very likely to happen, but that not all private transactions are inherently illegitimate. There's okay. some good reasons to be private in your transactions. Patrick Merck, we could talk for hours about this. It's fascinating, but we appreciate your time, and we'll very, keep a very close eye on how that Senate hearing uh, goes today. And we'll make sure you're up to date here on BBC World News. Now, the markets are having a fairly good session, particularly in China and Hong Kong. Let's find out why from Ali Moore, who's in our bureau in Singapore. Nice to see you, Ali. Um, so it's all about these changes that were announced, weren't they, at the, the end of last week in China. Market reaction as we start a new trading week. 
Absolutely, Sally. Chinese shares listed uh, in Hong Kong touched a six-month high earlier today. Investors are really cheering the potential impact of those extensive reforms announced over the weekend. A really big favourite is the announcement that the one-child policy is going to be relaxed. That's put the focus squarely on all things baby-related. Uh, stroller makers, dairy producers. In fact, the infant formula producer Yashi Ely surged more than 10% to a record high. Consumer stocks have certainly led the pack, but other sectors have benefited as well. Well, insurers, for example, off the back of changes in the financial sector. And there's a broader focus too: the decision to relax the, the HUCO system of household registration. If more people are allowed to move to the cities and have access to services, that means more housing, more hospitals, more schools, more roads. Uh, one broker's already upgraded their view on China from neutral to overweight. But of course, these changes have only just been announced. As always, the devil will be in the details. So Sally, I guess uh, no guarantees this enthusiasm will hold. All right, thank you very much. That's Ali Moore. I will see you soon as we talk you through the papers. Stay with us.